patriarchy. It exists, it's a real thing, and I'm going to present evidence in this video to demonstrate that. I was watching a conversation between Steve Shives and King Crocoduck on feminism, and one of the things that came up during the course of the conversation was an assertion that uh, King Crocoduck was not entirely sure that patriarchy existed or was a thing in the world. And I'm a, I was quite surprised at that because I'm a social scientist and for me, looking at the evidence, it's very easy to see the overwhelming evidence that patriarchy exists. And Steve's training is in the humanities, not in social sciences, and I believe King Crocoduck is studying in the, the natural sciences. So neither Steve has, I mean, Steve did a great job. Um, but he was kind of put in a, I think, a slightly unfair position of having to defend a discipline or an approach that he doesn't use himself and wasn't formally trained in. And King Crocoduck does not seem to have training in the social sciences in terms of our approach to investigating the social world. Given that gap in their discussion, I thought that as a feminist and as a published social scientist, and as someone who has actually taught on gender and politics and worked with patriarchal structures in political systems, that it's an important video for me to make to explain how social scientists define and examine the social structures that lead, that are bound up with patriarchy and are reproduced and lead to continuing generations engaging in the same patriarchal power structures. And in this video, that's pretty much what I'd like to do. Before I start, I want to do two things. I want to give you first an overview of what this video is going to cover, because in some ways it's going to have to mirror the discussion that happened on Steve's channel, because issues, philosophical issues of how we obtain knowledge and how we assess knowledge as valid or not came up during the conversation. And so I just can't rush to the data. I have to kind of go through that same process. So what I'm going to do in this video are go over the following sort of topics background, which is what I've just done. Then I'm, we're going to discuss ontology, epistemology, and methodology, because while Steve and Cro King Crocoduck's conversation discussed epistemology, they didn't take up ontology. And I think that that's important when you're dealing with the social sciences. I'm going to discuss the social construction of reality and give you an example. Then we're going to define patriarchy in terms of its definitions, and also egalitarianism, so that we can contrast the ways that the world could be structured, depending on you know which causal mechanisms are operating. Then I want to present a null and alternative hypothesis, operationalize my terms, and then we're going to look at quantitative evidence that allows us to conclude that patriarchy is a real thing that exists, and qualitative evidence that also triangulates to the fact that the patriarchy exists and people experience it in their daily lives. And then in the end, I'll kind of wrap it up with a conclusion that the Patriarchy is a real thing. The second thing that I want to do, and I'll do this just very quickly, which is establish my credentials as to why I know what I'm talking about. And this comes from two primary sources. One is my academic qualifications and my teaching qualifications. I'll put those up on the screen. In the course of my PhD, which I earned from the Department of Government at the University of Essex, I investigated using survey data whether or not the man-woman variable is appropriately called gender and is an appropriate measure to look at socially constructed gender influences in terms of how we account for political behavior and the answer was no. So I've been dealing with issues about the social world and topics related to politics and gender for quite a while now. I've also taught both quantitative and qualitative research methods at the postgraduate level at universities around London, as well as a course on gender and politics. Here is a list of my relevant publications. All of my pub publications use either quantitative survey data and inferential statistics. Or in 2010, I established the Qualitative Election Study of Britain, which was also conducted in 2015. And the conclusions from the qualitative data using narrative analysis, grounded theory method, and other ways that we're innovating data analysis for electoral data research uh, are based, those are what my publications are based on. We're going to move now on to ontology, epistemology, and methodology. These slides in part come from the teaching slides that I've posted on academia.edu for my quantitative and qualitative research methods courses. And if you're interested in seeing those lectures, they are Creative Commons attribution licensed and open to the public. I'll put links to those in the description box below. 
from Grix's The Foundation of Research. He says that ontologies can be summed up as what's out there to know and how does it exist. Epistemology asks what and how can we know about that reality that we think is out there. Methodology is focused on how do we go about acquiring that valid knowledge. Methods are the procedures that we use to acquire knowledge about the world that we want to understand. And sources are the data that we collect. We really could spend quite a lot of time discussing all of these notions individually, and there are great philosophy courses out there at your local institutions that I'm sure will help you do that. But again, I want to really limit this next bit to focusing on ontology. Are social entities objective entities that have an external reality to social actors? Or are social constructions built up from the perceptions and actions of social actors? And here I'm going to quote from uh, Blakey. In other words, ontological statements are claims and assumptions that are made about the nature of social reality, claims about what exists, what it looks like, what units make it up, and how these units interact with each other. By focusing in on ontology, we are going to be looking at the question, how does the social world exist? It doesn't exist like the material world. You can't point to democracy and say, um, that thing over there, that's democracy. You have to describe a system of a series of statements of, of factors that would agree with a definition of democracy. So it's not like measuring the external world. And there are two ways that you can examine the social world, and you don't have to choose between them. I think this is actually the important thing that kind of King Croc and Duck misses. You can be a mixed method researcher, and that's how I see myself. I think there are some phenomenon we can get at quantitatively, and some phenomenon we can get at qualitatively. And we need to triangulate, experiment, qualitative and quantitative research in our investigation of the social world in order to get the most complete picture of it possible. In terms of how the social world exists, one position is objectivism. And objectivism holds that reality exists independent of our knowledge of it. That social phenomena and their meanings have existence independent of individuals or social actors. On the other hand, Constructivism holds that the world does not exist independent of our knowledge of it. Reality is constructed by human actors. There are no central values that can be rationally and universally grounded. And the researcher, therefore, is always presenting a specific version of social reality, rather than one that can be regarded as definitive. If this all sounds very new and strange, I think there's something I can do to help you understand how we construct our reality, how there's a social construction of our reality that we all engage in. Hold on. This is a 50 pound note. No, it's not. It's a 50 euro note. This is a 50 euro note. And let's say you and I were having a little something to eat somewhere, and I pulled this out because I wanted to show you the map on the back or something. And you say, oh, you know what? I need some euros. Christy, can I give you $50 for, those, for that 50 euro note? And I was like, yeah, sure, that's absolutely fine. But um, just so you know, there's, this is counterfeit. There's a mark on the back that uh, they do a test, and uh, this isn't an actually a real 50 pound note, it's, or a 50 euro note, it's a fake one. Would you still be willing to give me $50? for this 50 euro note. And then let's imagine I say, ah, I'm just kidding. It's not really counterfeit. There's no mark on it. It's, it's real money. No, don't worry about it. In that instant, if we were having that conversation, what really would have changed about this, the value of this, that would make you willing or unwilling to exchange it for $50 or pounds or whatever amount of appropriate conversion money you in the country where you live? The, the fact is that nothing about this piece of paper changed. It was only your perception of its value. Why is 50 euros worth 50 euros? Is there some force in the world that determines this objective standard of money? No. It's only worth 50 euros because we say it is. That's it. Or we trust that people who determine how much money is worth say it is. And we go, okay, well, that's how much it's worth, so let's do this exchange. That's how we socially construct reality. And the social construction of reality around these pieces of paper determine the course of some people's lives. It's just paper. But our perception of it is what drives social reality.
This is best summed up by an Onion headline that I saw from a few years ago. And it really just kind of, yeah, this is the best thing ever when it comes to explaining the social construction of reality. During the time of the sort of the rise of the Enlightenment and the development of the scientific method, the investigation was focused on the physical, or the natural world. But as time went by, people like Auguste Comte, the modern, uh, the founder of modern sociology, looked around the world and said, you know what, I can, we can make observations about human behavior and we can make positive claims about what we can know. We can have positive knowledge, things about which we are certain when it comes to human behavior. And this is where the term positivism comes from, the idea that science would synthesize all positive knowledge about society. Durkheim built on these ideas and went and analyzed suicide statistics to build up a demographic profile of the types of people most at risk for suicide. This was an application of investigation and collecting data um, that was found in the, the, the natural sciences. We see the scientific method being applied to the social world and a lot of useful information can come from applying a more experimental, deductive approach to the social world. And I'm very much in favor of survey data and experimental data, but we can't treat human beings like atoms. We have context, we have meanings, we have feelings, we have histories, and to ignore the context, the linguistic, the cultural, the emotional aspects of human behavior, because we can't easily measure it or point to it or weigh it or use it in inferential statistics, doesn't mean we should throw out that data. It means we need appropriate methods to analyze that data. And that is where qualitative research comes in. When we take up a positivist position to analyze the social world, we're coming at it from an approach which states that an empirical theory attempts to describe and or explain a social phenomenon or phenomena using a series of interconnected abstract statements consisting of assumptions, definitions, and empirically testable statements. This assumes that there is a social reality that exists that we can measure. In a qualitative approach to social research, the view is that social phenomena and their meaning are being continuously created and accomplished by social actors. And the researcher is trying to present a specific version of social reality and understanding or trying to understand how others react and understand that particular social phenomenon. Now that I have what we think is a more accurate and fuller and richer understanding of the approaches that social researchers use to understand the world that we live in, I want to go ahead and provide some information on patriarchy because we're gonna move now into our patriarchy section of the video. To define the terms, I'm gonna go ahead and call patriarchy a social system in which power is held by men through cultural norms and customs that favor men and withhold opportunity from women. In contrast to this, I want to put up political egalitarianism, which is where the members of a society have equal standing in terms of political power or influence. In order to test the idea of, high, of, of patriarchy, you have to create a testable statement that predicts what the world would look like if the causal mechanisms that you identify to be in place are in place. Right? That's our alternative high theory, high, hypothesis. If there's no effect, that's called the null hypothesis. So here, I'm actually gonna use egalitarianism as the null hypothesis to measure whether or not patriarchy has an influence. So if everything is egalitarian in 50-50 or equally distributed in a fair way, that's egalitarianism, but it shows that patriarchy has no effect. So that is why I'm framing it that way. So therefore, the null hypothesis is men and women hold an equal number of positions of political power or influence in elected positions that would be the egalitarian social system. The alternative hypothesis is men hold a disproportionate number of positions of political power or influence in elected positions. And that, if we can reject the null hypothesis based on the evidence, then we have to accept the alternative hypothesis. In terms of operationalizing these terms, I don't think that egalitarian has to be exactly 50-50. I think there's obviously a, a range of distribution that's acceptable. So for the purposes of just creating some lines, I'm going to say that distributions that are within 45% to 55% distributed between men and women are close enough to be considered egalitarian. 
Whereas if men hold anywhere above 56%, and again, you can do this again on your own with your own data at 60% and 65%, wherever you think egalitarianism is appropriately contained to. But for this one, we're gonna look at 56 to 100%. That's an indication of a patriarchal system. To do this, I'm going to examine who holds power in a formal political system. I'm going to compare the rates of participation over time and I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to focus on U.S. data, one for time, and two because Steve is American and I'm assuming King Crocoduck is too. If that's wrong and I'm forgetting your accent, I apologize. But uh, if you want to, you can go ahead and use your own country's data and apply this analysis and see how it works out. In this slide, I've presented the, in, the percent of men and women in the House of Representatives since 1917. And I put an equality zone there in the middle, which kind of has that 10% range between 45 and 55. And anything that's read above that line is patriarchy. So this starts in the 65th Congress in 1917, because that's the first time a woman appeared in Congress. And I don't think it's a controversial statement to say that when there's 100% men in a body, it's patriarchal. So as you can see from this evidence, the House of Representatives has always been and continues to be a patriarchal institution. It is dominated by men and it is men who hold power and influence. The U.S. Senate, similar pattern with just fewer seats and you basically got the same overwhelming evidence that the U.S. Senate has always been a, p a place where men have held a disproportionate amount of political power and influence. Given this analysis, we can reject the null hypothesis that men and women hold an equal number of positions of political power or influence in elected positions in the U.S. And since we reject that based on the evidence, we must therefore accept the alternative hypothesis that men hold a disproportionate number of positions of political power or influence in elected positions. The conclusion, therefore, is that the U.S. Congress and Senate have always been patriarchal institutions and remain so to this day. We can also see this in terms of who gets to wield power in the form of committee chairs. So here's a picture from 2010 of all of the individuals appointed to chair committees in the U.S. House. And as you can see, they are all white men. This pattern basically repeats itself in 2015. I couldn't get pictures of the Dems, I couldn't get pictures of the Senate for the, the 2012 one, so I apologize for that, but these are the numbers for the House and the Senate in 2015. And as you can see, out of the 41 people appointed, only three are women, which is less than 10%. It's about 7%, making the people who are the most powerful committee chairs in Congress, 93% of them are men. Institutionally, we see, and this isn't quantitative, you know, I can't count this up, but we can look at this more qualitatively to see that because Congress and the Senate have historically operated on a seniority system, even if you got 50% of women in the next class of women coming into Congress, they wouldn't actually obtain political power for several years because of the seniority system. Now, seniority in and of itself, of course, is not sexist. It would benefit whoever was around longer. But it's another barrier to really integrating women into positions of power because it tends to, you know, hold people back. Another way we can look at this is qualitatively, and that is to look at an institutional, like a physical example of how women are disadvantaged in the houses of Congress, and personal accounts. I want you to close your eyes for a second and imagine what year this newspaper article comes from. Last week, room H211 quietly opened, giving the female members of the House their own restroom near the Speaker's lobby. That's the kind of comfort male members of the House have long enjoyed. Female members, however, have had to trek out of the chambers and buck the tourists in Statuary Hall to get to what is now called the Lindy Claiborne Boggs Congressional Reading Room for relief. When did women members of Congress get their own restroom? 2011. Women in the Senate have only had their own bathrooms since 1993. So just in terms of the infrastructure, you can see that the building was clearly designed with the idea that women would never hold political power, indicating that it is a patriarchal structure. The last thing that I'm gonna to point to in terms of qualitative research are the accounts of women themselves who have experienced sexual harassment or sexism in some form. That's from an article in Political called The Secret History of Women in the Senate. I highly recommend it. But when you go through it, you can see that women are disadvantaged in terms of their experiences, their ability to rise through the ranks, to get into leadership. 
And that is all a symptom of the patriarchal system that we've observed in the quantitative data. My conclusion, given its institutional and physical barriers to women's equal participation, the US Congress demonstrates the symptoms of a patriarchal institution. And given the reports of elected women of their experiences of sexual harassment or discrimination, we can conclude that many elected women experience Congress as a patriarchal institution. Therefore, this is an example of patriarchy right now that's happening, that's influencing people's lives, and it's determining the shape of American politics in many ways. So I hope this video has been helpful, and if there's anything else in the King Crocoduck Steve Shives video that you are interested in my perspective on, I would certainly be willing to do more. There's a lot to take on in that and uh, a lot of things I wanted to say, but this one was the most important. Okay, I'm going to go edit this video. So thanks for watching all the way to the end. I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Thanks for your time and attention. We'll see each other soon.